Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 228, Buzzard and Hurtado on God and Jesus, Part 1. In this episode of the Trinity's podcast, I'm going to present my edited version of an interesting conversation that first occurred in October of 2016. This was a video chat between Sir Anthony Buzzard and Dr. Larry Hurtado, and it was hosted by Sir Anthony's son-in-law, Carlos Jimenez. I've been privileged to have both of these gentlemen on the Trinity's podcast before, and I'll have links to all the relevant episodes on the blog post for this episode, which again is number 228 at trinities.org. Briefly, Sir Anthony Buzzard is a well-known biblical Unitarian author. Dr. Larry Hurtado is a well-known scholar of early Christianity. Dr. Hurtado's work has particularly focused on Christian practices of devotion to Jesus. In other words, worshiping Jesus, praying to Jesus, practices which are found in the New Testament and even, arguably, in some of the earliest books in the New Testament. This, as he's constantly pointed out, is striking, indeed surprising, given the Jewish context. Let me say, first of all, that I commend Dr. Hurtado for making himself available in this way, for opening himself up to questions by the general public for being willing to dialogue with thinking Christians outside the ivory tower. Most scholars of his stature do not do this. They don't like to submit themselves to questions or dialogue with anyone of a lesser stature than themselves. I've learned a lot from both of these men, and I'm very sympathetic to their work, although I have a few disagreements with each. I thought it would be interesting to present this conversation, edited by me for length, And occasionally I'll jump in and offer my own comments on the dialogue, in some cases objecting to things that they're saying. If you're not familiar with either Sir Anthony Buzzard or with Dr. Larry Hurtado, the first 20 minutes of this dialogue gives you a good introduction to each one and their work from their own mouths. Here then, Hurtado and Buzzard, hosted by Carlos Jimenez. Thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to have this discussion. I think I was asked to say something about how I got into this uh, sort of uh, question and the body of publications that have come from it. As a graduate student back in the early 70s, I read uh, Wilhelm Busset's uh, classic book, uh, Curios Christos, and was much impressed with it and thought to myself what a marvelous uh, breadth of scholarship it reflected. In the ensuing years, however, it became clear that there were a number of things on which his program was based that had been eroded by subsequent scholarly findings. Sometime in the late 70s, I took upon myself the rather um, daunting task of seeing whether I could conceivably uh, try to do an equivalent piece of work. The initial step in that direction was actually an article that appeared in 1979 that was a critique of Bousset identifying some of the pillars upon which his case rested that, as I say, had been eroded and that really called for a whole new approach to the question of the origins of uh, what he called the Curios cult. Basically, the treatment of Jesus as a figure who was worthy of participating, sharing in the worship that was given to God, uh, treated as as a divine being and having some sort of divine status. Then the first substantial piece of work I was able to do afterward was the One God, One Lord book that appeared in 1988, And the main main, um, research question or focus there was to look at the data that we had about the treatment of Jesus in the New Testament and to ask, how was it like and unlike uh, the Jewish matrix in which it first erupted? And in particular, what kind of resources were available in that Jewish setting that uh, early Christians may have drawn upon early before they were even called Christians or the members of the Jesus movement uh, may have drawn upon in helping them to understand what uh, the events that had happened to them ministry of Jesus and their experiences subsequent to his crucifixion. So the argument that evolved in that book was that in many ways, the rhetoric, what I call the Christological rhetoric or discourse that we have in the New Testament, 
seems to me to be broadly indebted to what I referred to, my term, not the ancient Jewish term, what I referred to as a kind of um, chief agent notion. Uh, various Jewish texts of the Second Temple period feature sometimes a principal angel, sometimes a great figure from the past, who is posited as exalted above all of the rest of God's entourage and acting in God's name in a very direct kind of way as God's executive, you might say, uh, executing redemption, such as the Melchizedek figure of the Qumran text, 11Q Melchizedek, for example. So my argument was that when you looked at the rhetoric of the New Testament, uh, it looked to me as though Jesus was being portrayed in basically that kind of way. He is um, constantly described with reference to the one God. So the Son of God, the Word of God, the image of God, the Lamb of God, and so on. However, the one thing that seemed to me to be difficult to square with that Jewish background was the devotional treatment of Jesus, the way in which he featured programmatically in their worship and devotional practice. Uh, because it seemed to me that the evidence of, again, that same body of Second Temple Jewish texts was very firmly that even such exalted figures as Mel Melchizedek or Messiah figures or angel figures were not to be given this kind of worship. Were not to, they thought of it as, in some sense, almost compromising the uniqueness of God, it seems. And as Richard Bauckham showed in an essay that appeared in the 80s, uh, you actually have several Jewish texts in which an angelic figure appears to give a revelation to a human figure the human figure, it appears confused, thinking that this may be God himself, starts to offer <coughs> the angel figure worship, and the angel very firmly forbids it, saying, do not do this, worship only God. In contrast to that, the New Testament picture showed uh, a fairly, as I say, programmatic, fairly ready inclusion of Jesus, along with God, as recipient of cultic devotion in an unprecedented way. So my argument was that that is the really distinctive uh, what I call distinctive mutation in Jewish devotional practice. And I focused on devotional practice rather than Christology as such, because it seemed to me that it was in the area of religious practice where we saw the most significant, uh, in historical terms, the most significant uh, developments. Subsequently, and my, my larger plan was to do something along the lines of Bousset, but it wound up taking much longer than I thought. Bousset was able to do it by his early 50s, uh, I'm not nearly as smart or as um, as well-read as he, and it took me much longer to, to do it. So over the course of the ensuing years, I chipped away at it with various pieces, including a little book entitled At the Origins of Christian Worship, which focused very much on looking at Christian worship in its not only Jewish but Greco-Roman context, and uh, various uh, essays and articles in journals and reference works, uh, as I say, chipping away at this or that problem, including an essay on the Philippians 2 passage, a famous so-called Christ hymn, a treatment of key terms such as Son of God, Lord, and Christ in New Testament writings. And uh, eventually, after a, a lengthy sabbatical granted to me here, uh, was able to produce then what was for me the, um, the magnum opus on this subject, the Lord Jesus Christ book, which appeared in 2003, and was my attempt to try to do a kind of diachronic study of um, the way in which Jesus featured in early Christian practice and, uh, uh, and, and belief from the beginnings of Christianity down through to Justin Martyr. That was sort of the, finally, my attempt to try to come up with something that would uh, be my best effort at emulating the uh, size and depth and quality of what Bousset had done. The little book that appeared later, um, How on Earth Did Jesus Become a God, appeared a couple of years later in 2005, and it emerged from a set of lectures I was invited to give in Israel at Beersheba. And uh, that was the title of those lectures, How on Earth Did Jesus Become a God? And that became the basis of, of the title of that book. And it incorporates the lectures that I gave, plus some of those articles that had appeared in the meantime in the back of that book. So those uh, comprise the major contributions. And all along, as I would emphasize, the, the questions that I've had are primarily historical questions. That is, what went on? What did early Christians do and say about Jesus? How did it have an impact on their devotional practice, their lived religious practice? Because I've always been interested, not simply in the world of uh, ideas or thoughts or doctrines, but in the actual practice of religion. And so it's basically been questions about um, what did Christians do with regard to the figure of Jesus? And can we, in historical terms, try to understand what may have shaped, prompted, and driven these developments? So one of the things that I laid out early on in the One God, One Lord book, and then returned to a couple of times because I got a lot of static over it, 
was the proposal that there were various factors that uh, collided to generate the shape of early Christian devotion. The figure of Jesus himself and his ministry and its impact upon people, of course, the nature of ancient Jewish monotheism with its emphasis on cultic exclusivity and only one God to the exclusion of other gods, the larger religious environment, uh, which also shaped early Christian devotion, largely, in my view, in reaction against features of the larger pagan world, but even in reacting against something, you're being shaped by it, so that was a factor. And then perhaps most controversially, uh, my argument that early Christians experienced what they took to be new divine revelations, which communicated to them the conviction that God had exalted Jesus to heavenly glory, shared with him the divine name, the divine throne, the divine glory, and that it was God's will for Jesus to be reverenced accordingly and included in uh, the worship practice of early Christian circles. As I say, I laid that argument out briefly first in the One God, One Lord book, later returned to it to defend and expand it and try to root it more firmly in wider kind of phenomenology of religion, history of religion work in an essay that appeared in the Journal of Religion in uh, 1999, and which is included in the uh, How on Earth Did Jesus Become a God book. And then more recently in an article that appeared in, in Expository uh, Times a lecture I was asked to give at Rice University, again, returning to the question of religious experience and religious innovation. That is basically, uh, I suppose, a potted history of how I got into this and how I've, uh, and the kind of questions that I've tried to answer. And a very interesting potted history it was. Just a few general comments that might be helpful to people first coming to Hurtado. One is that when it comes to the worship of Jesus, he focuses solidly on what he calls cultic worship. This is communal religious worship done in a regular religious meeting. And so it's not just any kind of honor, not just any kind of praise. Another thing to know is that he's part of what people have called the early high Christology club. This was a reaction against and a rejection of the assumption that had guided some earlier scholars that Christology must have developed slowly and that it was when the Gentiles came in that they started to regard Jesus as a god or, at any rate, divine in some way and worthy of worship. Hurtado has been one of a number of scholars rejecting that, and he points out that you see Jesus worshipped even in the writings of Paul, which are from the 50s and the early 60s. Also, notice that Dr. Hurtado's interest is historical, and this is really the value of his work, that it involves sober, careful, historical reasoning. I've found that often he's reticent to draw too many theological conclusions from these historical points. However, many consumers of his work, particularly in the American evangelical realm, draw a lot of Christological conclusions— in their mind, high Christology is that Jesus is God or that Jesus is fully divine. And they will cite Dr. Hurtado discussing the early worship of Jesus. However, as we'll discuss later, it's not clear that his work does really support that sort of argument. I said before that his conversation partner here, Sir Anthony Buzzard, is a well-known biblical Unitarian. What is Dr. Hurtado? Well, it seems to me that he's a Christian— and maybe in a broad sense, a conservative Christian, in that he isn't given over to some very revisionary program in theology, like in classical liberal theologies. As I read him, particularly on the basis of his book, God and New Testament Theology, he's a Unitarian who thinks that the one true God is the Father. But I happen to know that he doesn't accept that label. Is he a Trinitarian? Well, a Trinitarian thinks that the one true God is the Trinity. I don't know if he thinks that, but I think that he thinks the New Testament does not teach that. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Sir Anthony Buzzard takes a turn, and he describes his own intellectual and spiritual history. <laughs> 
thank you so much. You obviously find this whole subject riveting, as I do. And I'm a Church of England boy, sat in church faithfully every Sunday as I grew up, went to a boarding school where we went to chapel every Sunday and church every day. And at the end of it, I can honestly say I didn't know anything about the Bible. Now, I must qualify that by saying maybe I wasn't listening, but I don't think the clergy understood any of these, what I would think are critically important issues. These are not academic things. You said it so well when you talked about what drove them in their living the Christian faith. The doctrines, so-called, have been separated in the minds of some from the practical living. I think that's an impossible dichotomy. The truth of Scripture, for me, is what drives our lives. And one without the other, i.e. doctrine, sometimes thought of as boring, divisive doctrine, as the thing from Christian living, that's a fatal dichotomy. I don't think the Bible works that way at all. So going up to Oxford, I was taken to a Get Saved meeting, which is a new phenomenon in my life. And I went back to my room at Oxford about 19... Uh, 55 or so. And I said, what does this mean? And I spent the rest of my career trying to unravel that fascinating subject. And the thing that strikes me is this mass chaos out there. Whereas Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 says, I wish above all things, brothers and sisters, that you all say the same thing. You'd be perfectly united in one mind. We're evidently not there. So this is the sort of subject that I found myself in. I was published in the Evangelical Quarterly by Howard Marshall uh, way back on the issue of the kingdom of God in Acts 1.6 and also the kingdom of God generally. That's my parallel passion along with the Christology and the theological issues, the nature of the kingdom to come. And I see the nations beating their swords into plowshares one day, which in our present state of affairs is a very, very welcome and I think enthralling idea. Another subject, however. So I've written a couple of books. One was uh, The Doctrine of the Trinity, Christianity's Self-Inflicted Wound, and that was, I think, 1998. And later on, the second book, Jesus Was Not a Trinitarian. I was tempted to put in that title, Jesus Was Not a Trinitarian, Why Are You? But I think my friends felt that was a little bit too aggressive, so we left that out. But I approached this from a very simple, I hope not simplistic, position. I don't think any of what we're discussing was that problematic for the writers of the New Testament. They recited the Shema. Why would they do that? Well, guess what? Jesus did. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest of all the commandments in Mark 12, 29, with a friendly Jew on this occasion, he simply recites what we know to be the core affirmation of Israel. In your commentary, you nicely say this is a pre-Christian creed. Of course it is. Jesus is not innovating here. The God of Jesus is the God of the Jews, is the God of Israel, is the God of Abraham, and Isaac, and Jacob. That should, I think, be taken as absolutely given in any discussion. It's not because of what later happened beyond New Testament times where the church fathers, from my perception, as far as I understand it as of today, until you correct us if, if need be, the church fathers didn't do us any good. They went in a different direction and they turned that Shema into something which Jesus probably wouldn't have recognized. But that's another side of the subject. So with Jesus promoting the Shema, I noticed that Messiah Jesus brilliantly went on to say in Mark 12, 35, now what about Psalm 110, 1? And I would venture to suggest that the absence of Psalm 110.1 in the discussion is a serious weakness. And even our mutual friend James Dunn says that uh, Hurtado doesn't pay much attention to it in one footnote. I, that may not be, in fact, true, but I know you do refer to it in, in your larger book. However, I think Psalm 110.1 solves all problems as to the relationship of God and Jesus. Almost as though Messiah Jesus anticipated that they would turn him into a God, I like the title of your book, and much worse, turn him into God. So he's now Yahweh, co-equal with the Father in the minds of many. That cannot be right. And we're so thrilled to have giants in the field like yourself and uh, James Dunn and McGrath really saying what Unitarians have said from their much simpler uh, Unitarian position. That's not Universalist Unitarian, but what we would call Biblical Unitarian since the 1850s immediately the Adventists, not Seventh-day Adventists, but the Adventist movement then came up with this rather easy notion that when Jesus said God, he meant the Father. Now, that's a statistic that's hard to resist because 1,300 plus times, the Father obviously means God and obviously doesn't mean anything like a trinity. You don't find God meaning a triune God in Scripture. Well, that's rather startling. So I begin from that premise, and looking at that then, atheos, is this so hard? Jesus said the greatest of all the commandments is the Shema. I think the Shema, and I find you saying this constantly. I find McGrath saying it constantly. 
I find James Dunn saying it beautifully. And if I read at least some of Tom Wright, he seems to vary, but mostly he says the citation of the Shema is absolutely non-controversial. I think that's right. I don't think the Jews were mistaken about God being one unitary monotheistic person. My cousin, my mother's first cousin, actually, J.A.T. Robinson, in the 80s, and I was very inexperienced in the subject way back then, but he was writing to James Dunn, an article called Dunn on John, D-U-N-N, Dunn on John in the theology magazine in the 80s. And my cousin, J.A.T. Robinson, was attempting to show that if you take John's gospel, even, there's no trinity there. The Unitary Monotheism, J.A.T. Robinson says in many of his books, is simply the Jewish idea of God, and every New Testament writer is equally at one on that simple idea. With Psalm 110, one following immediately upon Jesus' statement of the Shema, there are two lords there. So may I suggest that an equivocation on the word Lord is bedeviling our whole topic? It needn't be. Nobody thought the Lord God was the Lord Messiah. Luke didn't. Luke brilliantly introduces the character in his narrative as the Messiah Lord, the Christos Kyrios. Nobody thought God was being born. They knew the Messiah had to be born. So it's equivocation on the word Lord. And then the false capital that's been placed on the second Lord in Psalm 110.1 in many of our Bibles is utterly misleading. It simply is not Adonai. You don't have Yahweh, the God of Israel, addressing somebody who is Adonai. This is God talking to God. Nobody should imagine that to be true. It's correctly rendered in the revised version, of course, a little l. Now, here's my major point. The word Adonai is easily subjected to investigation. And yet, even James Dunn, with all of his learning, misquotes the word as Adonai, I think, in his Unity and Diversity book. And I find people tossing out that second Lord as though it is Adonai when it isn't. Now, this is no small matter. Because Adonai, and I would venture to suggest everybody goes through it verse by verse, Strong's Concordance is not going to be enough. You're going to have to look at the Hebrew in some way. Strong's Concordance is rather misleading in some of these, these issues. But Adonai, starting in Genesis 18, 12, is 195 times on every occasion, not deity. It's the way you say that a person isn't God. And so to misreport the word as Adonai is a catastrophic mistake. What if we've ruined the simplicity of Jesus' point of view there? Quoting Psalm 110.1, he's forestalling the appalling notion that he would be rated on a total power with the one God and be Yahweh himself. So I love, of course, what you say so eloquently about Jesus being the highest form of agent. Absolutely. Biblical Unitarians, Socinians, you might say, or going further back, the dynamic monarchians, probably Paul of Samosata and others, they simply said, please don't interfere with the Shema. Yes, you can elevate Jesus to the highest possible rank, and you do that very eloquently for us, but he's still man and not God. It's that blurring of the distinction God and man, I think, is underlying all of our problems. So Psalm 110, 195 occurrences of Adonai, none of which mean deity, all of which mean a human superior, occasionally angelic, but never ever God. Adonai and God must never ever be confused. That's what Jews died for. And that I think is at the present time not clear in the Bible study of many. So our point would be then, let's get back then to deciding that Adonai is not the same as Adonai. The Lord God, the Lord Messiah are to be distinguished always. Nobody imagines that the queen flies the American flag over Buckingham Palace. That's self-evidently true. Nobody, I think, in New Testament times imagined that God was being born, much less that God can die. So what if Jesus is the Messiah Lord of Luke 2.11? And Luke, our brilliant historian there, immediately tells us that the Lord God, Yahweh, if you like, Adonai, the Lord God, is the Lord of Messiah. Jesus is the Lord God's Messiah. That's a perfectly good expression from Samuel and Kings, where Saul and, uh, and other kings were exactly the Lord's Messiah. So you have a clear distinction between the Lord's Messiah in 226 of Luke and Luke 211, where he is the Messiah Lord. A term beautifully found in Psalm, Psalms of Solomon, which in all of this material you've gotten together for us so well, uh, Psalms of Solomon 17 and 18, you find that same Christos Kyrios. Messiah Lord. Of course, nobody thought the Christos Kyrios was the Lord God until the church fathers seemed not to know their Hebrew very well, seemed to be anti-Semitic unconsciously, 
seem perhaps to say, well, I don't think this unitary monotheistic Jewish God is going to fly out there in the pagan world. So let's call it monotheism, but let's modulate it, mutate it in some way. Now, I agree with you. We all agree with you that you, there is a mutation in the sense that no angelic figure was worshipped at the level of Jesus. That's quite clear. The mutation does occur when Jesus is then elevated to a supreme position way above any angel. He's actually sung to, he's actually prayed to, he's actually praised. That's absolutely true. But that's the glorious thing that God has done with a sinless man, a virginally begotten man. It doesn't make him God, however, because Jesus is the greatest Unitarian ever. And if we as Christians are claiming to follow Jesus, we might want to start with the great commandment. And I don't think we're doing that well. Meanwhile, I'll finish with this. There are a billion Muslims who are aghast and millions of Jews who are aghast at what we're doing. What if we were to say, we agree, Jesus is the Messiah Lord, not the Lord God. The one God of Israel is the Father, One hundreds of times. Singular personal pronouns designate him thousands upon thousands of times. What if we've turned this rather simple issue into a nightmare complexity? Perhaps there's a solution still waiting to be found. As you just heard, Sir Anthony Buzzard is an enthusiastic restorationist and a crusader for the cause of Unitarian Christian theology. He thinks, like other biblical Unitarians, that the Reformation did not go far enough. The change that he's complaining about is the change from thinking that the one God is just the Father himself to thinking that the one God is the Trinity. Jesus held this theology, and Mr. Buzzard says, why don't we we who claim to follow Jesus. Now, by way of criticism, he blames the change here on the church fathers, and he doesn't really say which ones he has in mind. In my view, this transition that he's talking about from belief in the one God being the Father to belief in the one God being the Trinity, this happened towards the end of the fourth century. So maybe he has in mind people like Augustine and the Cappadocian fathers, But if you're talking about early year church fathers, people like Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, Novation, they're not Trinitarians. They believe that the one God is the Father himself. They think that the God of the Jews, Yahweh, is the one who Jesus prays to as Father in the New Testament. So they're Unitarians. So it's too simple to just say that these Hellenized fathers brought in the Trinity Really, there are multiple stages here. Briefly, what happens first is the Logos theories come in, and those were indeed Hellenistically motivated. They were motivated by the cosmology of Plato's Timaeus and by the previous Hellenized Jewish theology of Philo of Alexandria. So there's a more complex story that needs to be told. In the second century, they start talking about the Logos as a second god, a, quote, God who's in a sense less divine than the one true God and who is distinct from the one true God in number. You get the strong impression when you read these Logos theorists, these very speculative Hellenized theologians of the second half of the 100s, that they were embarrassed by the man Jesus, this recent Jew who died a humiliating death at the hands of the Roman authorities. They much preferred to go on and talk about this Logos, this being who was the direct creator of the cosmos, a kind of intermediary and go-between between the ultimate and the creation. They were proud to trumpet belief in this logos in a Gentile, Greco-Roman context. And sometimes it practically seems like they've forgotten about the man. Really, they began to struggle with how to relate the man to the logos and came up with some different ideas. Now, about Mr. Buzzard's complaint that people have run together two different ones who are called Lord in the New Testament, that is to say, the Lord God Almighty, and then the Lord's Messiah, the exalted man Jesus. About that, I'm pretty sure that Dr. Hurtado agrees. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Hurtado responds.
I take your point in a number of things, uh, and uh, I don't think it's a, it's a, an entire disagreement, but I'm not sure that it's an entire agreement either. You know, some of my sharpest uh, disagreements have been with James McGrath and with James Dunn on some points. Uh, your reference to, the, to Jesus' statement about the Shema, certainly the Gospels report Jesus as acting as a devout Jew, and when asked what is the greatest commandment, he, de- he does what any devout Jew ought to do. The point I would make, though, is that the Christological claims that are made about Jesus in the New Testament and the attendant devotional practice that we see attested and reflected as early as Paul's letters already taken for granted, In both cases, these Christological claims and this devotional practice rest primarily upon what God has done uh, about Jesus, not what Jesus claimed for himself. Obviously, the claims of Jesus were significant, but as you will know, scholars find it difficult to be sure that even during Jesus' own ministry that he actually claimed to be Messiah. Uh, It's hard to find overt references to that. I personally think it's quite likely that his disciples expected that he would be made Messiah that he would be vindicated at some point and made Messiah. But in any case, Messiah, of course, doesn't justify the the massively inflated Christological claims that we have in the New Testament and the consequent devotional practice that we see. Instead, they claim God has raised Jesus from the dead in their language. God has exalted him to heavenly glory. God has given him the divine name, the divine glory, as I've said, uh, sharing the divine throne. And he is to be reverenced accordingly. In a sense, when you say Jesus never claimed to be divine or any such claim such as we have reflected in Paul, uh, that's both true, but with respect, irrelevant, it seems to me. It's a red herring, because the early Christian Christology that we have in the New Testament is primarily based on claims about what God has done, what God has said, and what God requires. I grant you that that means still, in my view, that still means that Jesus' divine status is expressed with reference to God the Father, with reference to the action of God. Uh, He's not an independent deity. He's not a second deity. His divine status, which uh, justifies him being worshipped and glorified with the Father, is attributable to God, God the Father in their language, God's action. The closeness of the way in which they feature in the discourse that we have in the New Testament already in Paul is, it seems to me, reflected in a particular kind of uh, peculiarity that we have already in Paul. And that is, and you've already alluded to it, that in Paul, very often, uh, God is referred to as God the Father and Jesus the Son. The intensification and proliferation of father language for God is, it seems to me, a direct corollary or consequence of the notion that God had exalted Jesus to be the unique son who shares in some sense rightfully in divine glory. And therefore, in order to distinguish the two, which they're always wanting to do, God is very often referred to simply, as you say, as Hotheos, but very often also as God the Father, as in Paul's letter openings, God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. I think I I would also hesitate over two other points. You talk about the, the later church fathers in it seems to me, again, a a bit of an unfair way. I mean, I don't think they got up in the morning with the intention of being difficult. I don't think they got up in the morning and said, now we must make a bunch of complicated, crazy ideas in order to make later theologians scratch their foreheads. They were trying to work with honest questions that were pressing them at the time. I don't think they manufactured these questions. They were on the table. Arthur Wainwright once put it, the doctrine of the Trinity comes later But the problem that the doctrine of the Trinity addresses is already there in the New Testament. We have a problem. And that problem, so to speak, or datum, is what I've described in the little 2010 book, God and New Testament Theology. We have what I referred to there as a distinctively triadic-shaped discourse about God and a distinctively dyadic-shaped devotional practice. That is, the incorporation of Jesus programmatically as recipient of devotion has no parallel or precedent in the Jewish background. And so subsequently, as Christian theologians from the late second century onward began trying to articulate their faith in language that the philosophical environment of the time could appreciate, engaging their intellectual world, just as every theologian should try to do, they tried to do it. The categories they were working with involved categories of 
divine essence, divine being. And so they had to ask themselves questions. Well, is Jesus of the same essence or being as God the Father, or is it a different essence or being? Because on the one hand, we distinguish the two. On the other hand, we incorporate Jesus as recipient of worship in the way in which God alone is supposed to receive. So this was essentially the problem, how to deal with that. Now, various theologians of the second, third, and on into the fourth century came at it in different directions and proposed different solutions. We may or may not like how Nicaea came down on the issue, but they weren't trying to be difficult, and they weren't trying to, I don't really even think, trying to be anti-Semitic. Sorry from what you said. I think they were trying honestly to solve problems as best they could. Now, they were human beings, and so they fought with each other. They slandered each other. They exaggerated what each other said. They did all the stuff that you do in theological refutation, unfortunately. Uh, and so we have a lot of distortion and a lot of overreaction. But I guess I would want to say that um, in the midst of all that, they were working with some real problems, some real questions, and they tried the best they could to solve them. We don't work probably today with the same kind of Platonic categories that they worked with. I mean, after all, for example, what do we mean if we were to say divine essence? What is divine essence? I wouldn't know what that means. And it doesn't make any sense in modern philosophical terms. So we don't work in the same categories, but they had to. They had no choice. You know, I give them credit. They did the best they could, taking an adage, you know, a man deserves to be hanged by a jury of peers. I don't know that I can sit in judgment on what they did. That doesn't mean that we simply have to repeat and echo their formulations. We have to think through things for ourselves today. But I guess I would want to show a bit more respect than I thought came over in your address about those uh, second and third century theologians. And the final point I guess I would make is you used a phrase, Jesus is man, not God. Well, if you mean man, not hothelos, that is, he's distinguishable from God the Father, of course, but I think we have to take account of the evidence from presumed already in Paul that Jesus was what theologians or his, historians, exegetes referred to as somehow pre-existent that he was there with God as, for example, the agent of God's creation of all things, human being, and yet a pre-human, however you want to put it, pre-existent, pre-human kind of existence as well. So it's, it's a bit more complicated, I think, than simply quoting that text from Mark. So many interesting things to comment on here. One point Dr. Hurtado makes is that it's too simple to just ask, what would Jesus have done, or even what would Jesus have taught? His point is important, which is that according to the New Testament, and this has always been part of Christian tradition, divine revelation continued after the earthly ministry of Jesus. Divine revelation continued. That's where Paul comes in. That's where the interesting developments in the book of Acts occur, the sending of the Spirit, the bringing in of the Gentiles without having to convert to Judaism. So he's right about the general point, but as concerns core theology, as concerns who the one God is, is there a difference between Jesus and Paul and John and the author of Hebrews? I don't think so. As far as I can tell, they all think that the one true God is the Father. Now, Dr. Hurtado is pointing out that Jesus didn't claim that he had created the world, that he had pre-existed his human life, or that he was divine, and that's quite correct on all three counts. You have to leave the door open that these things could be taught in the New Testament, even though they're not taught by Jesus. Of course, the question is, are they? Another point is, I notice how careful, even cagey, his language is. Dr. Hurtado talks about the divine status of Jesus with reference to the action of God. If Jesus is in some sense divine because of God's action, and he has in mind here God's raising of Jesus from the dead and God's exaltation of Jesus, if Jesus is divine in virtue of those divine actions, then he's not essentially divine. He's not the kind of being who can only be divine. It sort of sounds traditional to say that Jesus has divine status in the New Testament, but if he has that status just because of the action of God sometime around 33 AD, then this is really going against all mainstream Catholic traditions. 
Mind you, I agree with Dr. Hurtado, but my point is that by talking about Jesus having divine status, it almost sort of obscures the difference between what he's saying, the New Testament says, and what small c Catholic traditions say, based on, say, the creeds starting in 451. He says that Jesus isn't an independent deity and not a second deity. Well, again, I agree. There's only one true deity in the New Testament, and that's explicitly said to be the Father. Now, about Jesus not being a second deity... Here, Dr. Hurtado disagrees with some of the leading church fathers before Nicaea. He's explicitly called a second deity by some of them like Justin Martyr and Origen, and he's really taught to be a second and lesser deity by really all the other non-Patroposian church fathers before Nicaea. That is, if they say he's a deity, then he's a second and lesser deity. So, I agree that in the New Testament, Jesus isn't supposed to be an independent deity and not a second deity, and I would add he's not supposed to be the same deity as the Father, either. But that is what fully developed Christian Trinitarian traditions say, either that the Son and the Father are the same deity, or they are, quote, persons within the one deity. Well, that's not in the New Testament, either. Nor is it in these church fathers of the 100s and 200s. Has Sir Anthony been unfair to the church fathers? Maybe, but to just say that their intentions were good is, I think, not too relevant. I mean, how good their intentions were really varies quite a bit, I would say. Dr. Hurtado says they're not trying to be anti-Semitic. Well, (laughs) whether or not they tried, some of them succeeded beautifully. But again, they vary quite a lot here. Some of them have a fundamentally positive attitude towards the Jews, and some of them are really pretty shameful on that score. They vary widely. One thing is undeniable that the view that Jesus was a real man who did not pre-exist, this comes to be pilloried as a mere man view, and it is associated with the Jews and with kind of an earthly and fleshly outlook as opposed to a more spiritual one. Finally, there are a couple of assumptions that have become popular in contemporary theology, and I don't really know how they became popular, but I think they're not true. And I think these are assumptions that were passed on to Dr. Hurtado in his education somewhere, maybe in graduate school, and maybe he hasn't examined them as much as he should. One of them is what I call the confusion narrative. This is the view that something about Jesus' ministry threw Christians into theological confusion, and then it took centuries to sort that out, and that's where we get the Trinity. In Dr. Hurtado's version, the confusion was relating to worship. So the idea is that, hey, I thought we were only supposed to worship God, and then in the New Testament you see the worship of Jesus, and yet he's distinct from God. Well, sure, he's distinct from God. He died. God never died. And so, what are we to make of this? Well, I would say, first of all, it's not that simple. This is to ignore the role of those Logos theories. They came charging in in the 100s, and there was a big reaction against them. The various kinds of people history calls monarchians were rejecting the Logos theories. The Logos theories developed from two-stage theory to a one-stage theory. And I think it's really just not true to say that they were puzzling the whole time about worship and how can we worship more than one. Some of the monarchians collapsed the father and son into the same being, and so then they were only worshiping one. But as far as the Logos theorists, if you read people like Origen, they weren't particularly worried about this, or even Justin Martyr or Irenaeus. They thought that the one true God is the father, and so they worshiped him, but they also worshipped this second and lesser deity. And what's the problem, really? Now, you have a problem if you think that, as the Ten Commandments say, you can only worship Yahweh himself. Some popular evangelical apologists will argue like this, that according to the New Testament, we must worship Jesus. And, second premise, according to the New Testament, we should only worship God. And so, therefore... The New Testament is implicitly teaching that Jesus just is God and God just is Jesus, that they're one and the same. 
If you can only worship God, and yet you must worship Jesus, then Jesus must be God. Dr. Hurtado, I think, rightly recognizes the conclusion as obviously false. There are differences between Jesus and God in the New Testament. They're right on the surface and undeniable. But Dr. Hurtado's own work shows that the second premise there is false. It's not the New Testament view that we can only worship God. In fact, the New Testament view, as he has explained very well, is that we should worship the one God, and also the one God wants us to worship his exalted human son. So it's false that we should only worship God. We should worship God and the Son of God. And this is exactly what you see in Revelation chapter 5, and it's what you see in Philippians chapter 2. Of course, because God has raised him and God has installed him in this, so to speak, divine position where he must be worshipped, then the glory that's given to Jesus, the honor that's given to him, really goes to God as well. It's, as Paul says, to the glory of God the Father. The sort of worship argument for the deity of Christ, if that means that Jesus is God himself, Dr. Hurtado's work shows that that's an unsound argument because it has a false second premise. If you shift to this sort of argument, that the New Testament says worship Jesus, and the New Testament says that you should only worship a being which is essentially divine, which has the divine essence, which is equal to God and God's defining properties like omniscience and omnipotence and being uncreated and eternal and untemptable and so on. So the second premise isn't only worship God, but rather only worship a fully divine being. And so the conclusion would be, therefore, the New Testament is teaching that Jesus is a fully divine being. Again, Dr. Hurtado's work undermines that second premise. The New Testament doesn't say that Jesus should be worshipped because he has the divine essence or because he has all the defining features that God has. Rather, it says that Jesus should be worshipped because this is God's will, that we should worship Jesus and not only God. The way we know it's God's will is because God has raised and exalted him. Now, as to the confusion narrative generally, I don't think it's true. I don't see any confusion in the New Testament. They're not worried about how Jesus relates to God. They firmly think that Jesus is a real man, descended from David, miraculously born, killed, then raised from the dead by God, and exalted by God to a high position as the one Lord under the one God. That's the New Testament view. They're not worrying about whether there are multiple persons in God. That idea really comes in quite late. It comes in the 4th century, really. I recommend my podcast 189 if you think the New Testament writers are confused about sort of how many persons God is. Finally, there's another assumption of the Modern Theology Guild that Dr. Hurtado very well expresses here, and it goes something like this. The creeds were important back then. The creeds tried to state Christian truth in philosophical terms which were current then, but which are now outdated and irrelevant. And so, therefore, theology in the present day must refashion and reform the Christian message in categories that modern people can understand. The first thing to say about this is, it's kind of remarkable that this view can exist within a conservative Christian milieu But it does. A lot of Catholics and traditional Reformed theologians and Eastern Orthodox people, I think, would vigorously reject this. They would say, hey, the homoousion is just as relevant now as it ever was, and we understand it just fine. And it's just ridiculous, maybe even heretical, to suggest that this language has somehow become outdated or that the categories of thought have now been superseded. So many traditional Christians would just reject it as highly revisionary. My objection is that it's straightforwardly false that philosophy no longer talks about essence and being. It most certainly does. And the theologians who said this in mid-20th century perhaps were under the sway of some extreme movements in philosophy like logical positivism, which dismissed all metaphysics as meaningless 
and thought that they could somehow build an experienced based and fully scientific philosophy in place of older metaphysical philosophies. This program is dead. It's dead and gone. Now, Platonism, of course, is dead and gone. There really aren't any Platonists around. That's not a living philosophy. Okay. But what some people call Platonism now is just belief in universal properties. Things like humanity and divinity. And these are sometimes understood as essences, as defining features which a certain sort of thing must have so long as it exists. So the idea of essence is very alive in philosophy. The term being, it could mean an individual, like a concrete entity, or it could mean a kind, like an essential kind, like a universal. But yes, all of this is still relevant in metaphysics. Really, there's nothing that's in the classical creeds that has become irrelevant because of cultural changes or philosophical progress or anything like that. That's why you have analytic philosopher theologians like Dr. Tim Paul of the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota defending the traditional Catholic views about Christology, about Christ having a human nature and a divine nature. And this is why you have a number of brilliant philosophers like Richard Swinburne, William Hasker, Peter Van Inwagen, Michael Ray, and Brian Leftow, you have people like this taking the creedal Trinitarian language and trying to make literal sense out of it. They try to interpret what the divine nature is supposed to be. They try to interpret what the persons of the Trinity are supposed to be. And never do they say, well, we all know that's an obviously mistaken and outdated notion Things can be outdated in philosophy sometimes, but uh, it's harder to make things go the way of the dodo in philosophy. Things like the idea of an individual being or a concrete being, the idea of an individual property or a universal property or defining essence, which consists of properties, these core ideas haven't gone away and probably never are going to go away. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Sir Anthony Buzzard responds to Dr. Hurtado's last statements. Thank you so much. Those are very interesting observations. And I agree, we should not be unfairly critical of our forefathers. We as restorationists, I suppose, are attempting to suggest to people that there are better ways of reading the Bible than they may have learned in church. In my own case, the Bible went from being a non-book in Church of England circles to a rivetingly interesting book once I saw that Jesus was Messiah. Absolutely right. People of learning don't say that Jesus is atheos. However, the public does. If you go to a local church here in the South, if you're not prepared to say Jesus is Yahweh, fully equal, co-equal, that he is God, you can't even get a job volunteering in a church. I want to put an end to that. I'm not happy that Calvin would have burned one of our colleagues at the stake. So part of my anger, my frustration, if you like, not anger, that's too strong, is that we really don't need to be that obtuse about who God and Jesus are. So if I may just go back to the one of the points you made, absolutely unprecedented exaltation. That's a new thing. It's a mutation, if you like, in reference to previous exaltations of angels and so on. That's quite clear. This is absolutely brand new. However, it falls short of making him co-equal, co-eternal God, which is what the Trinity eventually did. That's what I object to. That antagonizes Muslims and Jews, I think, quite unnecessarily, and it doesn't really fit in with the strongly unitary monotheistic terminology of Scripture. Part of the problem in these discussions is, is if I may say, the fog language. What in the, uh, what in the world is meant by the veneration of Jesus? We must be clear. 
if we're talking about worshiping Jesus as God, fully God, Yahweh, I think we're both against that. So I would only suggest that in the Bible, you don't define who somebody is by the verb that's used in his direction. You don't say, as many do, they haven't had the opportunity of learning this correctly. Many say, well, Jesus is worshipped, therefore he's God. That is simply false, because they haven't studied their Hebrew Bible. They haven't looked at that wonderful Hebrew word, shacha, and seen that Bathsheba worshipped her, her son. They haven't seen that Saul was worshipped. They haven't seen that other figures were worshipped. That's a fundamentally muddling, indistinct failure, I think, of simple language. So you cannot say, well, Jesus is worshipped, therefore he's God. Jesus walked on water, therefore he's God. Our colleague here, Kirk, did so well when he said that Peter was divine, and there's another fog word, he was divine for a few minutes walking on water. This is simply a muddle. No, we define God as the one God, the Father, 1,300 times, the God, as Bishop Wright says so nicely, with a polemic edge on it, our theos. Once we say that, and I, you appear to be saying that very nicely for us, then we must decide who Jesus is. He's exalted to a level that is unprecedented. Therefore, he is sung to, he's worshipped as the Messiah, but not as God. That is to undo, I think, the thing that Jews, Akiba notably, died for. We don't need to do that. It's so easy and simple for children to understand that God is one person. When you say, once you say he's three persons in one God, then we're into all of that muddle. So I agree with you entirely. God is the judge of how those church fathers did. But why was it necessary to depart from the Jewish unitary monotheistic statement of the New Testament? One other point, I happen not to think that Jesus pre-existed literally. I'm with James Dunn here, who eventually came to understand with J.A.T. Robinson, rightly or wrongly, that there's no pre-existence literally. The birth narratives are very much against that. No, he begins in the womb of Mary. He's obviously begotten as son there. You don't need a literal pre-existence. That would turn him into an angel, first of all, which he clearly is not. With great respect to our 12 million Jehovah's Witnesses at the door, he's not an angel. Worse than that, though, he's not a co-equal, co-eternal God figure either. I don't think that will work in the New Testament. Unfortunately, much of our translation is misleading. When you read in Colossians, for example, by him everything was made. This is false. Nigel Turner was really good, a friend of ours, Nigel Turner, way back. He's very clear, as are many others. James Dunn constantly. There's no need to translate in such a way that the word was a person other than the Father. Our uh, good friend Colin Brown, Dr. Colin Brown at Fuller Seminary, is entirely with us on this point. He was kind enough to say in class that he had a colleague in Atlanta, referring to me, with whom he agreed. So I think it's time we got rid of this literal pre-existence, which complicates God eventually, even if you only start with a pre-existing angel or whatever. Don't need that. The synoptics are entirely clear. So my final point at this stage would be that Daniel Kirk's book is absolutely balm to our soul. Insofar as he says that if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke, you couldn't possibly get to an incarnation capital I, although I believe in incarnation a small I. We know that Jesus is what the word became. He is certainly theos, godish, if you like, very much like God, but he's not the one God. In that wonderful book, A Man Attested by God, that's a wonderful title. That should be enough. Finally, then, what if Paul said it all? and spared many of us the labor of writing all these books. What if Paul said it correctly in 1 Timothy 2.5? For us Christians, there's one God. That's the Father. I got it. And then there's one Lord Messiah. A man. I got it. I don't think it ever needed to be more complicated than that. This has devastating results for our relationship with Jews and Muslims. James McGrath says it very well. I quote from page 40 of his One God book, the Shema is in desperate need of clarification. I say amen to that. Desperate. Next week, we hear the rest of this dialogue, starting off with Dr. Hurtado's response to what we just heard. If you can't wait for next week, you can view the original video. It's linked on the blog post for this podcast, episode 228. 
There's also a link there for the YouTube channel of the Restoration Fellowship. That's the house church and organization founded by Sir Anthony Buzzard and his wife, Lady Barbara Buzzard, and attended by Carlos and others. And we've also got links for Dr. Hurtado's blog and previous podcast episodes featuring interviews with him. This week's thinking music has been Shuttleworth Interval by Marco Trovatello. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this episode where you can listen to or download the entire track. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook. And help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinity's Podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.